best watch his step around here. I can't believe he had the face and grace to come a-prowling up here on Thunderhead Mountain, electioneering for votes and shaking hands with every darn critter on it. To an outsider, the idea of a constituency might have seemed contradictory enough in these rugged wilds. Yet, the presence of voters on Thundering Creek was further attested by a group of timber cutters who had stopped at the spring so their oxen could drink from it. And, while waiting, they had given themselves over to the interest of local politics and the fervor of the controversy. Well, they tells me that he made a powerful good attorney general last time, and it appears to me that the mountain folks ought to vote for him again, because he was born and raised right down here on the slope of Thunderhead Mountain. He never left here till he was 20 years old, when he went to live over yonder in Sevier County at the courthouse, and after a while he even went to a study in law. The last speaker was the most unrefined of the rough bunch, and it was clearly apparent that he was innocent of all book learning and was poverty-stricken as to the world's goods. Instead of a wagon, he had only a rudely made sled. His lean oxen were easily thrust from the water by the stronger and better-fed teams, and his argument in favor of the re-election of the Attorney General was received with scant courtesy. You're a darn fool to be bragging that Rufus Chad is a mountain boy, exclaimed Abel Stubbs scornfully. You know good and well that he's as thick as skin with them town folks down yonder in flatland country. And just look at all the good men folk from Thunderhead that he's done put in jail. And after all they've done for him too, it was our vote that elected him the first time he run. I tell you, it was the voting folks on Thunderhead that carried Rufus Chad. And what did he do? If it hadn't been for his term of finally giving out, he would have jailed this whole mountain after a while. Truth is, it was mighty hard for folks on Thunderhead to aid in the election of a prosecuting officer. And after that scoundrel Rufus was elected, it was common knowledge that he set out of trying to rid the area of the manufacturing of blockade liquor by jailing the same folks who had put him in the office in the first place. And then townsfolk, Abel Stubbs continued, at first, they was mildly upset about the way the election had turned out. After all, having a mountain lawyer over them flatlanders was mighty humbling to their pride, I reckon. Nobody had ever heard such tale of a thing before. But then when all us mountain folks started getting sent off to the penitentiary, them town folks changed their tune about Rufus Chad. Now they claim they've never had such a good attorney general before. And now they're going to have another election. And here it is, a Rufus a-leading in the polls just as graceful as he'd been a lying politician all his life. Well, drawled a heavy fellow, a rigid soul speaking for the first time. I won't support Rufus Chad. I ain't never seen a man as unpopular as he is on this mountain. I've heard tell that the kinfolks of some of them folks that he locked up has sworn to get even with him yet. Heck, Rufus has already been shot at twice in the woods when he tried to show his face up here on Thunderhead. I seen him yesterday down in Gatlinburg, and he showed me his hat where a rifle ball had gone plumb through it. Just then, the driver of the sled spoke up. They tell me that old Rufus is going to be speaking down at Thundering Creek Settlement tomorrow, along with five other candidates that are running against him. But I tell you, I like to hear him speak. He's got a smooth tongue. Well, he did talk mighty sharp and stinging the first time he was electioneering on Thunderhead. The rigid voter reluctantly admitted, but... If you ask me, that tongue is going to get him in trouble now that he's been living down there with them town folks. Well, I can't stand here all day a-jawing about Rufus Chad. I've got my wheat to thrash this week, although I don't expect I'll make enough money even for seed next year. But anyway, I'll be getting along. The ox carts rumbled slowly down the steep hill, and the forest was left once more with a fitful stir of the wind. The shadows of the oak leaves moved to and fro with dazzling effects of trickling sunbeams. Afar off the blue mountains, 
shimmered through the heated air. But tongues were wagging up and down the hills and hollers. That tomorrow, Rufus Chad would be electioneering up on Thunderhead. But the real question was, would this mountain boy turn city slicker politician be able to leave Thunderhead on his feet? Or would he leave in a box? Hey guys, JD here. Click the link below to check out my new book. It's full of stories just like the one you're listening to right now. Now, back to the story. The settlement on Thunder and Creek could only be reached by the winding wagon trails that led up for miles on the side of Thunderhead. There were several rustic cabins, each surrounded by a rail fence, and the community had built a church that doubled as a schoolhouse, and Ned Johnson ran the general store that was walled in by the jagged ridges and the dense forest that filled the background. There sitting in a split-bottom chair on the front porch of Ned's store was the only human creature that could be seen in the mountain hamlet, a man whose appearance was strangely at odds with his surroundings. He had the long, lank frame of a mountaineer, but instead of the customary brown jeans, he wore a suit of blue flannel, this simple attire and the cigar that he smoked had given great offense to the already prejudiced dwellers on Thunderhead Mountain. To them, it was clear that Rufus Chad had taken up with them town folk ways and had even took to a wearing store-bought clothes. His face was in great contrast to the faces of the stoic mountaineers. It was keenly chiseled. The constant friction of thought had worn away the grosser lines leaving sharply defined features with abrupt turns of expression. There stood the man that some years ago it had come to pass that a raw fella from the unknown wilderness of Thunderhead Mountain was elected attorney general. It was a startling sensation that awaited the dull courtrooms of Sevier County, but Rufus seemed to have brought with him his mountain instinct down to the courthouse. He possessed certain subtle native instincts the wiling doublings of the fox, the sudden savage spring of a mountain lion, and the deadly approach of a copperhead. Yet his name had become a terror and a threat to any aspiring purveyor of illicit mountain dew. It wasn't that Rufus was a schooled scholar, for he barely knew any law. Yet he possessed a remarkable dexterity with a few broad principles familiar to him and a certain swiftness in their application. They all admitted that Rufus was a natural orator. His success laid in his influence on a jury, and his influence on a jury was due to a magnetic earnestness and a strong belief in his own powers that each and every word carried conviction on it. And there Rufus sat on the front porch like the prodigal son returning to his mountain home, thinking of these things with his absorbed eyes fashioned on the horizon and of the change in himself since he had left his humble mountain home along the slope of Thunderhead Mountain. There he had lived for 17 years in complete ignorance of the alphabet. He was the first in his family who could even write his own name. Yet somehow from this almost primitive state, he had overtaken the civilization of Sevier County town in the valley. And he had big plans for the future. And they started with ending the untaxed liquor here up on Thunderhead so he could get it legalized and taxed to sell to those tourists who didn't know any better down in Gatlinburg. Only a short while ago, he had been confident when he thought of them, but now they were hampered by the great jeopardy of his re-election. He had experienced a stiff rebuttal in stumping Thunderhead. He had been called upon by the small but rowdy crowd to justify the heart bearing and prosecution upon Josh Green for making three jars of corn whiskey to put food on the table for his family. But Josh was given seven years in the penitentiary for exercising nothing more than his God-given right to make corn liquor. The opposing candidates capitalized on these attacks. They charged Rufus with his most brilliant exploits as ingenious pervasions of the law and attempts upon the liberties of the people. Rufus justified his past conduct by the curt declaration that he had done his duty according to the law. And then he asked for the votes of his fellow citizens with an arrogant attitude worthy of any low-down line politician. Now that the debate was over, the afternoon was wearing away 
and the lengthening shadows were shifting across Dad's store. A sound broke the air, other than the muffled thunder of the falling water in the distance and the droning sounds of the katydid. There come from the rocky path, treading through the forest, the regular beat of horses' hooves. And in a few moments, three men rode into the clearing. Their arrival brought Thundering Creek to life as sundry feminine faces were thrust out of the rude windows. Passels of unkept children started up from unexpected nooks. Even the storekeeper strolled to the door and stood with his pipe in his mouth, leaning heavily against the frame. And Rufus Chad changed his position with a slow, lounging motion and turned his eyes up the road. Well, said the storekeeper with frank criticism as the trio came into sight. Isaac Boker's drunk again. It's the nature of the critter, I'm a-thinking. He's been to the still, just as sure as you were born. And I hope it ain't a dancing drunk. The last time he had a dancing drunk, I tell you, he bounced up and down the floor and hollered and sung and such and made such a disturbance that Thunder and Creek folks were kept awake till daybreak. Nothing could stop him. Well, a few months behind bars will help him out a little, I'm a-thinking. Draw the lawyer. But that ain't the right sort of talk for a candidate, Rufus. The storekeeper Ned admonished him. And it ain't safe know-how for such a slim, stringy boy like yourself to be talking that way about Isaac Boker. He's a tremendous man, and strong as an ox, too. Oh, he ought to be put under lock and key, Rufus replied. That would sober him up. I wish these dancing drunk fellas could be sent to state prison. Why, I could make a jury think ten years was almost too good for that fella. I'd like to see him try to get away from me in my courtroom. The three men had dismounted, hitched their horses, and were now approaching the store. Rufus Chad rose to shake hands with the foremost of the party. Uh, I never looked to find you here, Rufus. I thought you'd have left Thunderhead like those other candidates did as soon as all that promising in line was over down at the debate, said one of the arrivals. What have you done with the other candidates? Well, I left them behind, <laughs> like I always do. And as I expect to do come next Thursday, if I can get you to promise to vote for me, Rufus said with a hearty chuckle. Yet Isaac never so much as cracked a smile as he turned the quid of tobacco in his cheek when he finally spoke. Well, I ain't gonna vote for you. Not nary one time. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, said Rufus. Can I ask why? Now, Isaac Boger wasn't the type of man to waste time arguing, but he steadied himself as well as he could do, and he looked vacantly into Rufus's eyes. But still he hesitated, with a sudden anger and flaming from his bloated face. Rufus waited for a moment for a reply, and then he turned carelessly away. Well, I best be getting back down to the valley. All that's sitting in that chair has sure plumb wore me out. Just then, Isaac Baker finally spoke. Well, if you were where you ought to be, a following a plow, instead of putting good men in jail, you wouldn't get a chance to tire yourself out from sitting in a chair. Hell, they tell me that you don't know no more about the law than a mountain fox. Rufus laughed, and he sneered too. His patience was evaporating with these men dressed in homemade clothes. Still, he restrained his irritation as Isaac went on. If you ask me, any man too good to follow the plow ain't good enough for my vote. And that is why I ain't gonna vote for you. Just then, the politician's eyes narrowed. He was feeling cocky. Well, fella, I don't need your vote, Rufus said sharply. The burly fella paused for a moment. With his wrath rising, he exclaimed, You're the damnedest critter I've ever seen in this country, Rufus Chad. You got the nerve to come electioneering on Thunderhead Mountain. I got a good mind to break this empty bottle right across that pumpkin head of yours. He said, raising his clenched fist. Well, well, hold on there, sir. If you come a step closer, I'll be forced to press charges on you down back at the courthouse. And I'm a powerful man, one that you wouldn't mess with if you had any sense at all, Rufus said. Just then, a bystander spoke up. Well, Rufus, that's a mighty powerful, curious tale to go around the mountain. After all, you've done all you can to torment your own folks up here on Thunderhead, the same folks that elected you afore. And then you finally got the nerve to come back up here again. And the first man that says he won't vote for you, you threaten to put him in jail. It appears to me, said Isaac Boger, as he was still shaking his fist, that there ain't all yet in that penitentiary that deserves to be there. Better men than politicians like yourself have been locked up and hung too since you were elected to that office. 
In that moment, there was a sudden change in Rufus's attitude. There was a strong tension of muscles in his neck, and the quickening of blood showed in his scarlet face. There was a fiery spark in his darkening eyes. Oh, come on now, Rufus, the storekeeper said hastily. You ought not to get to fighting with Isaac. Just walk yourself off for a while. That's quite all right, Ned. This fella can say whatever he likes while he's drunk, replied Rufus with a short, scornful laugh. I, I know his kind. He ain't gonna do nothing. He's the type of fella that saves his fist for his wife once he gets back home. Ain't that right, boy? As soon as those words escaped his lips, every man in the store had to hold Isaac back, who was suddenly completely sober and furious. It seemed that Rufus had forgotten the code of the mountains. Any man who dared to utter words like that to another man was bound to pay a steep price. Rufus smirked and tipped his hat, and just as he turned to leave, Isaac spoke up one more time. You take care on your trip down that mountain. You take real good care, law dog. Cause I tell you this, fooling with me is like making faces out of rattlesnake. It might be satisfying to your feelings, but I tell you, it ain't safe. Rufus mounted his horse and turned towards the woods. Glances of undisguised hatred followed him from the group about the store and from the figures in the windows and the doors of the cabins. Even the half-clad children who paused in their spiritless play gazed after him. And soon, the long shadows of the forest fell upon his path as day gave way to night. A few hours later, smoke rose from all the chimneys of Thunder and Creek as mountaineers huddled in front of the dancing flames of their fireplaces, when a terrifying hoarse cry could be heard from far down the mountainside. The men still sitting on the porch of Ned Johnson's store took their pipes from their mouths. What in the world was that? Do you reckon it was somebody hollering for a cow? One man asked. Well, maybe it was, the store owner said. But it's best to mind our own business. That was the last time folks on Thunderhead ever saw or heard of Rufus Chad again. One week later, folks down there in Sevier County re-elected him again. Yet, strangely, Rufus never bothered showing up for his victory speech. At the courthouse, no one knew where he went. He had simply vanished in the thin air. Some people down in the valley believed that old Rufus had went back to living on the mountain, while others claimed that he just decided to retire from political life. But the folks on Thunderhead always claimed that Rufus just might have stepped on a rattlesnake. Rattlesnake.